Hello everyone at home and thank you for joining us for FMA's first digital fest. My name is Julie. I'm an artist and creative consultant that helps brands with PR and marketing strategies and materials and developing brand guidelines. You can follow me at Ideas by Julie for more information on that. Um, today we are discussing the business of jewellery with these fantastic panellists we have here. Amifa, Melanie and Annabelle, if you'd like to all individually introduce yourselves. Um, Emma, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm Emma Cole, and I'm um, a jewellery designer maker based in London. Melanie? Melanie Eddy, so jewellery designer, um, educator, and kind of industry related <laughs> individual um, based in Hertfordshire in terms of living, but with a workshop in Clerkenwell, London at the Goldsmith Centre. Fantastic. And Annabelle? Um, Annabelle Davidson. I'm a freelance jewellery journalist. Um, I edit the annual Vanity Fair on jewellery issue um, and I write for The Telegraph and Vogue and The New York Times and other publications. Um, and I'm from New Zealand originally, but live in London. Fantastic. And thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, and we're looking forward to you sharing your insight. So first question, can you tell us a little bit about your creative journey, your interest in jewellery and how did it start? Uh, um, so I'll go first. Um, my journey into jewellery was uh, possibly fate, um, predestined, not sure. Um, it was by accident a little. Um, I stumbled on an advert in a magazine for um, jewellery and silversmithing at the then called London Guildhall University. Um, and I very nearly went off to study um, forensic science, but then I thought, well, that looks interesting. So I tried a 10 week um, jewellery and silversmithing course in my local um, area, which was, is Hammersmith and Fulham. Um, it was an adult education uh, course and I loved it. And so I applied and uh, the rest is history. Uh, so after an ND, an HND and a BA, um, here I am just uh, working. But I suppose I've always had a love for jewellery um, and I trace it back to my earliest memories um, of jewellery where I, I went to a night market in Accra, Ghana. Um, I was quite little, I can't remember how old I was, maybe about six or even five and I um, was able to buy something so I picked a really lovely pair of um, red stone. I, I would maybe garnet but I love rubies so let's let's say rubies um, with gold and they were just beautiful studs and I, I just love uh, lovely jewellery so yes here I am. Lovely. Melanie? So well I think I'm from Bermuda originally although I've been based here now in the UK for 16-17 years so my first interactions were with jewellery and Bermuda similar to MFA and that I kind of, I, I find most people I know that are in jewelry, it's kind of like jewelry finds them as opposed to like them finding jewelry. If you talk to almost anybody, it's like, it's like, oh, all of a sudden I was in this area with jewelry. So similar thing, I was about 17, I think. And I was um, on school holidays um, and my mom sent me on some errands to keep me out of trouble and busy. <laughs> and she sent me to pick up some jewelry from a local jeweler there. That had been I don't know adjusted or repaired or something and he's always super busy so I was waiting and looking at various displays and I asked him some I'd always been interested in it but I hadn't thought about myself doing it so I must have asked him some questions that to him were not like the typical questions he gets so he kind of elaborated a bit more and then um, kind of found out for me that I had made some rudimentary pieces of jewelry like in craft classes at, at high school and stuff like that and invited me to come in on Saturdays. I already had a summer job, so I couldn't come in like during the week. I was already kind of doing that, but um, kind of invited me to come in on Saturdays to find out more about jewelry, making jewelry and jewelry business. And that's what I did for summers and holidays for about four years, all the way through um, when I was due to go off to university. So I did that all the way through 
my undergrad degree, I was studying something else and the penny dropped kind of towards the end of my uh, degree that actually I wanted to do. And I knew more about it then. And I think it helps because it was a, it was a black jeweler and I didn't know any black jeweler. All the jewelers I knew that were in Bermuda were kind of European or American. And, um, you know, he, I think having, seeing it from his perspective and seeing him doing it totally was um, instrumental in the fact that I'm now here you know, as a jeweler. And it kind of went from there. And I then left, um, trained kind of there, went on to work for another jewelry company full-time, um, a bigger jewelry company for me to full-time later for a number of years. And then kind of came over here initially for only a couple of months for some professional development and still here 16, 17 years later, because that led to some more training, some other courses, and then to setting up my own business. Incredible. Thank you, Annabelle. Um, I think I've always loved jewellery. I, I, as a child, I was obsessed with tiny things. I just, I had this absolute obsession with the miniature. And um, my grandmother had a very ordinary uh, 1940s charm bracelet that was all the rage back then that you went on your travels and you bought a charm from every country. And uh, I couldn't have loved it more. I was so obsessed with it. I would just sit there for hours looking at every single tiny charm. Um, so I guess I'd always, always loved jewellery. And then after I went to university, I did literature, English and French literature, and I did a postgraduate in journalism. And I thought I wanted to write about fashion. And I did for a time I was a fashion editor, but then once I started looking into jewellery, I realised it was such a rich subject. It's such a, it just covers every aspect of humanity almost and there's so much history and um you know it has longevity so I it just it very quickly surpassed my interest in fashion and I genuinely am absolutely fascinated by by jewelry and the stories I can tell like I can just see the facial expressions from all of you as you just like explain and talk about your career journey in jewelry it's just fascinating um so which leads me to what my next question um defining what we're talking about fine jewelry as opposed to accessories and costume slash fashion jewelry why is the difference so important I I think I'm going to take this one because I I kind of focus on fine jewelry because it's a Fine jewelry is basically anything that uses 18 karat gold and, and gemstones. That's kind of the industry standard. Um, and then if it's like 14 karat gold or nine karat gold or plated, it's considered demi-fine or fashion jewelry. Um, but I think the, I love all jewelry. I, I love costume jewelry. I love, you know, especially costume when it's like, you know, the pieces they made for the catwalk when, you know, Chanel first started showing, et cetera, like great big pieces made from glass and paste and, uh, you know, uh, materials that weren't so precious, but one really important element to um, the reason why it's important to differentiate is that the materials of fine jewellery are expensive and can be prohibitively expensive, and it can be a real barrier for entering the fine jewellery sphere if you don't somehow have the funds to buy those materials because no one's giving them away for free, um, or you're not already part of a jewellery family that has those materials, or you're not already part of a some sort of I don't know you have some kind of sponsor because gold and diamonds and emeralds and rubies are all really expensive products so I think that that's why the, def, the um, defining those things is important can I just jump on and add a little bit I think as well for us as a focus um, that's an area where we all have kind of, an, you know, where we're involved in to some extent. And we have like kind of experience of that, like jewelry so vast, <laughs> you know, in terms of all the different elements that it can be that I think, you know, that's it, our areas of kind of like expertise, I guess, or experience. Okay, brilliant. Um, what is JFF and what does it hope to do? Because I believe you're all a part of that, right? Yeah. Yeah, so could you tell us a bit more about JFF and what you hope to do with it? Yeah, so, so JFF basically is a, um, it's an initiative that came about um, initially, like around June, July last, like not this, not gone, but the summer before. Um, and we were looking at what was happening in various industries as a response to um, to George Floyd's murder and the social justice kind of like movements that were coming like kind of globally 
um, around this. Well, I guess he, he has culminated, but we're also looking at Rihanna Taylor, George, um, Armin Arbery, like, you know, so it's just like, I think we were looking at the jewelry industry and we were kind of like waiting for certain things to come. We're not waiting, but we were like, okay, this is happening here. This is happening here. Like what, like, and it was like, we weren't seeing it happening with the same like kind of momentum and speed. And so basically we came together and we were like, can we, can we get some momentum? Can we canvas the people we know? Can we see if we can get enough momentum to kind of make a going concern of trying to kind of coalesce some of the different areas that we had been working in on this into something more formalized. So then it became an initiative. Um, and then I can let, I, I think every, all of us can have different, can add different points in here about it, but it became an initiative that wasn't just looking to like raise funds because there were a lot of like um, kind of fun, fun schemes or like grant schemes, but something more lasting. So something that was more looking at institutional change and like kind of addressing the systemic kind of racism within the industry and the challenges that that imposes for um, jewelers of black heritage wanting to enter the fine jewelry space. I think for, for me, it was just a really, really simple question. It was, and I'd always noticed it, why were there so few black faces on Bond Street when most of the materials used in fine jewelry come from the continent of Africa or South America? Um, and India and you know I met Vanya Layla's an amazing jeweler who's from Guinea-Bissau about 10 years ago and I, I just said I can't believe you're the first black jeweler I've met on Bond Street like all these materials come from Africa and are dug up by mainly black hands and it just seemed like an extraordinary extraordinarily unfair um, situation so it was that was kind of the question I'd asked and then people started sort of putting their hands up and introduced me to other black jewelers. And then it was like, well, you know what, there's, a, there's actually an amazing group of black jewelers out there and they should be celebrated and highlighted. And then when we came together as a four with Rachel Garahan, who is our other member, who's the watches and jewelry director at Vogue, we just started thinking, well, it actually needs to start from the beginning and it needs to, jewelry futures funds should be about the futures. So the, going back to the very beginning of, you know, learners, kids at school, and um, going into schools and saying, this is a career opportunity for you and how do we do that? I just have to apologize. I'm next door to a goldsmith, um, a silversmith. So you might hear some hammering um, whilst I'm speaking. Um, for me, um, going to university, there were very few black people on my course. Um, so I realized that um, in order to find out about jewelry, which like, for me and Melanie stumbling upon um, jewellery, it would help to let children know um, at a young age that this is actually a possible um, career path that they could take. And so um, just following on what Melanie and Annabelle have just said, the, the grassroots um, secondary schools, particularly um, the referral, pupil referral units where um, lots of kids are, um, excluded from mainstream mainstream school and put in these units, um, not much hope for the future. If we could get to some of those um, children and hopefully change lives and, and introduce them to a whole world of possibilities. Um, so that's, that's the real thing that I'm sort of very excited and passionate about. And also, as we know, jewellery itself is quite um, an elitist um, profession um, and we see we tend to see the same faces in, in press um, and, and even risking the same thing with black jewelers if it's the same faces all of the time then it's the same whether you're black or white so we need to constantly um, be refreshing this space and giving other people um, that opportunity to be to be celebrated for their amazing work. Since we, we, we sort of lose out on so many amazing people because they don't know, they're not in the right circle and they don't know the right people to be in the press. So yeah, it, it spans from secondary school right through to um, um, the sort of upper end of your um, career. 
Um, one of the other things for Jewellery Futures Fund is, apart from raising money and, and hoping to provide grants and things for, for students, et cetera, it's also um, uh, in-kind advocacy. So really encouraging other Pitna members of the press to always include the work of black jewellers to find black jewellers. Like, like Emma says, it doesn't need to be the same black jewellers all the time. We need to find and celebrate the work of, um, you know, all sorts of jewellers. And one thing Emma said in a recent talk we gave is that, you know, one day, hopefully it's just normal for there to be black people in the jewellery industry. It's not abnormal. It's not unusual. It's not, doesn't need to be, you know, we don't need this sort of, you know, oh, find a black jeweler and include them. It just, there will be just as many black jewellers as there are white jewellers, as there are Chinese jewellers, as there are Indian jewellers. And it, it shouldn't, you know, it's not going to be an anomaly. But until then, we need to kind of do the work to, to encourage and to highlight and in the same way that I really like, you know, we have to cover the big brands who advertise. That's how magazines work. That's how the press works. But, you know, we also need to cover fabulous independent talent that doesn't that doesn't necessarily have the resources to to um, have have PR or have marketing. Um, but it, we we need to make sure we're including black jewelers along all the way along. Absolutely. And I love, love, love the sound of that initiative. Um, so this leads me on to the next question. Um, how do we combat the tokenism in the media and large e-commerce platforms that seem to only pick and give space to black designers whose designs are very much their cultural heritage, whilst non-black designers are featured everywhere repeatedly? It's almost as if um, black designers cannot just design jewellery that doesn't tap into their cultural heritage without receiving much recognition. Emma, for you're nodding, so you go first. No, I, I'm nodding because of personal experience where people find the need to make this connection with where I come from. Um, and sometimes the work was just created, there was no connection to where I come from. And you're, you're right, um, it, I, I'm nodding because it's a thing, it's almost like, well, if, you, if we're going to give you this platform to showcase your work, let's connect it to Ghana, or let's connect it to Africa. And I'm like, I just made it, you know, it, it has no connection to Africa, apart from the fact that I'm of African heritage, like, can we, you know, there are other pieces I make that are inspired by my heritage, but not everything. So, um, and, and you get um, a lot of designers worldwide are um, inspired by the African continent. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can hear the silversmith hammering away. Um, that they're inspired by the African continent, but it's never the main sort of focal point when they're spoken about. It's about how brilliant they are. As opposed to, you know, if you look at Picasso and, and other designers, complete and um, artists, just completely inspired by Africa and all things African, but it's never that main um, focal point. So I, I that's why I was nodding. Sorry, Flynn. Can I jump in? Because that's really, really interesting for me to hear. And I was going to be a little defensive and say, I don't know if that's the case, but it's really interesting to hear that it is the case. Um, but I know as a journalist, I'm always trying to find a, I always ask jewelers, what was the inspiration behind something? And I, I don't know, I don't think I've ever particularly been like, you know, what is your African inspiration? I just, you do want to know the inspiration, whether it's, well, I know, I know, for example, Emma, for you are inspired by volcanoes and all sorts of things. Um, but we do often try and find a hook and I know people can feel shoehorned into um, a category um because they uh like you've just explained um but i think often um it's unintentional but it's really good to know that because going forward i'm going to be aware of the fact that you feel like that yeah i think as well it's interesting how like they're just the kind of then putting people into niches like i work in a very abstract modernist way and people assume that that means that it's come from a European tradition, but that's not necessarily the case. Like, I mean, I, I come from a country where architecturally it's, it's in our heritage of how we build houses, it's in our heritage of how we approach certain things. So I think like 
it's interesting that people ascribe their own ideas about like the source of inspiration or perhaps like, you know, how I've come up with my methodology for how I design and make um, around like, you know, things that are, it's, and that's about to some extent um, what gets celebrated, like, you know, who's considered to be the, the, the holder of certain kinds of, <laughs> of styles. <laughs> So I think a lot of that is just about decolonizing that whole space and understanding that like, you know, people can can design and make from a variety of inspirations. It doesn't have to be specifically relevant to to one particular area that happens to be, you know, tied into their cultural heritage. So I think it, that's about that that freedom to be able to do whatever you want as a, as a, as a designer or maker. And right. just to add, it's the freedom to be able to design in, um, and be inspired by the whole world because we are citizens of the world. Although we like to place ourselves in these little bordered off countries, we belong to, to the world. And so we can be inspired by everywhere. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, what advice would you give to someone wanting to get into the industry? Oof. Depending on what sector. Um, okay, think about, okay, for example, me, I've never worked in jewelry. I've actually start, like learned quite a bit from all of you. So what advice would you give me as someone who has zero experience, apart from buying jewelry, um, who's interested in getting into jewelry, maybe designing or something, what advice would you give? Well, I think if you're just looking at designing, so for, if it's looking at making that you might want it as uh, Amefa suggested, introduce yourself to some, some basic techniques through an, an introduction course. That's a good way to start. But if it's designing, I think a good place to start with design is to think about what you're interested in, what your preferences are aesthetically. So I think before you can then create something, you have to understand where you're coming from and what your, what your kind of, what your voice would be, what your, you know, what your truth would be in that space. So then maybe look at the things that you're interested in, like other types of, um, other types of, you know, applied arts or crafts, like, are you interested in heavily textured things? Are you interested in certain kinds of forms? Are you interested in certain color patterns or certain types of things? And then you could kind of start gathering that information together and see where your aesthetic kind of area is to some extent. And then you can start developing where you might want to take that in terms of jewelry, like what scale of jewelry do you want to make? What kind of materials do you want to work in? What interests you? So I think there's a lot of research and a lot of work that has to happen to some extent, even before you get to the point of designing a piece of jewelry so that it comes from you and is, is tied into what you're interested in and what you want to put into the world in, that, in terms of an object. And, and from a press suggest. perspective, you know, I always say to young jewelers or people starting out that, you really need to have a, a voice and a like a, a perspective and a point of um, like like Melanie says you're going to be coming from somewhere because often you'll find with young jewelers they kind of just they will sometimes just present a body of work that has no like um, uh, focus or it looks a lot like a lot of other people's work and it's like you need to like I can spot. Emma's work and Melanie's work from across a room. They both have very distinctive styles and I won't go into describing them because I'll be here for days, but you know, they've got a really, really distinctive look, both of them. And I just, I know both their work, but you kind of, if you're going to be a jewelry designer, I feel like you, you need to have that. And then my second piece of advice is before you even start, go to the um, Richard, uh, Judith and Richard Bollinger gallery at the Victorian Albert Museum and spend a couple of hours there and go to the gemology hall at the Natural History Museum if you're a Londoner and spend a couple of hours there like probably the most inspirational places to go definitely and I would say have an open mind don't go in with um sort of preconceived ideas of how you how you want the finished piece to look um oh my goodness Blame the silversmith. <laughs> um, okay, so um, sorry about that, guys. Um, I thought I had everything on airplane mode, but um, obviously not. Right. Um, just saying to keep an open mind, um, and you, someone could look at um, something like this 
and already have a finalized piece in their in their head and they go to the bench and they create that piece it's about for me my BA course was the best thing I did because it taught me how to look at things differently so the the ND and the H and D are fantastic for um for getting the right bench skills but the the degree course teaches you how to think a bit more about what you're doing why you're doing things and um and just also to take time out and critique your own work um so sometimes you feel that the work is good enough but it really isn't and you can only find that out by spending time with yourself and your work and remembering what you've been taught by the tutors so i would highly recommend after um if you if you do a course where um you're interested in it definitely take up one of the degree courses like what Melanie um, teaches at Central St. Martins. I think that's a fantastic way if you want to sort of reach the highest level of being a jewelry uh, designer slash maker. One, one, of the, um, one of the aims of the Jewelry Futures Fund is that we can help people access these courses and help fund um, uh, parts or all of these courses. Um, because you know, for some people, going to Central St Martins isn't an option, or go, doing taking time off to do a ten week course isn't an option. So we want to try and make it more accessible. Okay, brilliant. And final question: um, Not everything that is faced can be changed. Um, writer and activist James Baldwin once said, "But nothing can be changed until it's faced." What are your hopes for the industry? Who wants to go first? Yeah, you, you go first. <laughs> um, for me, I, I I really agree with that um, statement by James. Um, and I would just like to add that um, what we're doing is hopefully um, a, alongside other organisations like the FMA and, and others, which I wouldn't mention today, um, hopefully we have started something that will create long lasting change in our industry um, and make it, um, like we said earlier, normal to mm. see black makers in this space at the highest level, um, you know, being mentioned as standard, as normal, without the need to mention the colour of their skin. Yeah, ideally we wouldn't have to exist. Right. So ideally, we wouldn't have to be here do, doing this work. I mean, obviously, we could we would always want to be support in a, you know, a, a position of to support or assist or help or, you know, in that way. But the idea would be that there would be equity, not just equality, but equity in the space so that so that it's it's holistic, you know, throughout the whole, uh, you know, industry, throughout all the different aspects of it. That, um, that we normalize not just um, jewelers um, from Black heritage, but also the idea that, um, that Black people buy luxury, that Black people are the consumers, that they're also um, driving like a large portion of this market in terms of sales. So I think there's lots of things that have to happen around that, but ideally we wouldn't, <laughs> we wouldn't have to be here doing this. So that would be the, that would be the great thing. But um, I think at the moment, it's just to see to see things move from agenda items and from policies and strategies into action plans and into actual, like actually things happening. I think a, a lot of us are kind of, you know, we've seen it go up on the agenda. We've seen it kind of in the strategies and the policies, but now we wanna see like the actual movement and the actual action and the actual things happening to address these, these challenges. I guess for me, um, just briefly, I know we're running out of time, I would, I'm really looking forward to the day when those people who don't agree with us and don't think this is necessarily realize that actually they were wrong and they're going to be left behind. Perfect. Thank you all so much for joining us and the audience at home who've joined us. I hope you're inspired and enjoyed this session of these incredible, incredible individuals. Make sure you check out JFF. Um, and if you have any questions, um, please feel free to send them to us via the live chat section on the website. Um, and we'll see you at the next session. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Julie. No problem. Bye. 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 Thank you.